We're here at uh, COP17 in Durban at the UN Climate Talks. It's Youth and Future Generations Day at the UN Climate Talks. We've got some of the future generation of South Africa here today. Uh, I'm with Stuart Bunello and, let me get it right, Mokadi, uh, who are three young people from South Africa who have been here today. Uh, they've been learning about uh, climate change all week, and we want to hear a little bit what, about what you're experiencing in terms of climate change in South Africa. So, um, Stuart, why don't I start with you, since you're closest to me. Um, why don't you introduce yourselves, tell us who you are, uh, how old are you, uh, where are you from? Hi, I'm, I'm Stuart. Uh, I'm a guy from a province called Mpumalanga in South Africa, and I'm 17 years of age. What is that province like where you live? It, 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 it was usually it was known to be a very a, a natural province. We had lots of wildlife and, and nat national parks. We have one of the biggest national parks in the world, actually called the Kruger National Park. So, we the people up there re re were reliant main, mainly on tourism and, and farming and activities such as those because our province used to be rich in nature, if I can say so. Mm -hmm. so and has that changed? Yes, in the past, in, in the past few years, recently, in recently, it has changed because, like, it, it you, you wouldn't recognize it for its past glories. These days, there's a lot of mines, there's a lot of carb, there's a lot of carbon, carbon emissions because of the development and in industries in, in our, our towns. You you find that people are driving big cars. There's no there's the, that spirit of nature con conservation doesn't exist anymore in my province and. The, 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 there has become a, a, a large impact due to, to, due to climate change and the environment there is changing drastically and rapidly. You talked about the mines that you're seeing there. How is that impacting your life? It, it, it has a big impact because daily I see people, people, people getting infected with lung diseases and, and cancers and it's all because of the pollution in the air and people are ignorant and they, they, they want profit, they, they want money so they do not even care about their well-being, they, they are not even informed of their well-being so that, that's the changes that are happening. And, yeah. Buinello, tell us uh, how old are you and, and where are you from? I'm 16 years old and I'm from North West. From the northwest of, of South Africa? And what's it like where you live? Uh, where I live, like it used to be like there would be like many fruits. Now is is known of like the platinum and the farming industries like they, they used to farm. Now it's so dry that you can't even survive a day like farming. Mm -hmm. So how does the dryness change things? Uh, there's more poverty. Yeah, and people are suffering a lot because when you want to farm, you'll have to like work hard and like get a truck, a tractor to do that, not for yourself, like you're not doing it yourself. And is your family really suffering from, from that? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> not really, but others are suffering because and my family is not farming. Yeah. And how does that change life for a farmer? Because like he's like for a farmer, like that person will not get money, and you know, like all the things will just go down, and the industry will close. Mukada, where are you from? I'm from Limpopo, the northmost province in South Africa, and I'm 16 years old. And, and what sort of uh, t town is that? How are you seeing things change recently? Okay, um, Limpopo is a very hot place, um, and a lot of people they rely on on farming, on the small gardens at home to feed their families. And since this whole climate change thing, it's either in some areas it's hotter, and then in some areas it's actually wetter. So in the areas where it's dry, like at home where I'm from personally, my neighbors they used to have this huge Plot, plot of land and then they just farm there but then since there's a change in the climate and the change in the seasons they plant in the wrong season and then when the right season comes they can't harvest anything so it's kind of like changing how they eat and then they have they it's, 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 it's very difficult for them to provide food for themselves because of they, they they don't have any they don't get they don't have jobs and that garden was kind of like their main source of food so since that problem they they can't do that so what are they doing now? How are they coping? They, they're not coping at all. We, we're trying to help them in the best way we can by informing them to... They're actually helping us with the recycling project we have and then we, we sell those things to, to companies and they give us money in return. But they, that's a small amount of money and then it, it's not the, the, it doesn't provide the same amount of food or the same amount of nutrition that they used to provide for themselves. So it's actually very difficult for people who have plantations at home and who rely on plantations to actually adapt because that's the only thing they know. They never went to school. They don't know any form of education. They can't get a job. So that garden is their main source of, of food, their main source of income. Mm -hmm. So you guys have all been uh, working with UNICEF this week. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing? 
Okay, um, UNICEF has been helping us set goals. We have SMART goals, which must be specific, uh, measurable, and yeah, yeah, what SMART stands for. And then they're just helping us on how we can we can grow the projects we have in our community to help fight against climate change and how we should do them. They're just teaching us how to be big planners, even though we have small ideas, but then how we can make our small ideas big and then how we can make them very effective and influential. Yeah, so they're just helping us plan and being big, yeah. And they've, they've been giving us platforms where we talk to different delegates about our ideas and how can, they, how can they help us. So what sort of ideas have you been delivering to the delegates? Like we wanted to, like, to have a curriculum whereby we learn climate change in schools from grade 1 to grade 12. And we wanted to like, have a competition whereby we plant trees in provinces and the most green province wins some prize. And they responded, they say, like, we'll work on it. And Stuart, I heard that you had an exchange earlier today with, um, with some of the ministers and your, your group was all talking to some of the delegates from the South Africa uh, mission here at the UN Climate Talks. What was that like? It, it was great because you, you could have that sense of being in a room where the actual talks were happening. And actually, uh, the, 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 the highlight of the day and the talks, it was the fact that we came out with a, a concrete solution. Like, we, the, the people on we, and us as the youth, we're going to form like a South African coalition, on, South African youth coalition on climate change. So at least today, unlike any other day, we found progress and concrete evidence. Instead of just that the government officials just put it, sending us from down back and forth and pillar to post not knowing not giving us solutions just being too political and and capital and kept being kept like seeking capital on, on on issues they they at least today they come they came to the party and brought something concrete so and what's this youth coalition going to do it's going to basically engage with with different youth organizations throughout the country and issues such as climate climate change and spreading the the message and 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 spreading the message across so that each and every person or each and every young person in the country knows about climate change and they can be able to go green so yeah what do you guys think in general about this whole process do you think this whole UN process can make a difference I, for once, um, okay, to tell you the truth, my spirit, I'm, I'm a little bit down spirited about what I expected from COP17 because of some of the withdrawals from Japan and Canada. But then I'm hoping that the countries that are still in the Kaito can actually take this seriously and notice that the choices that they're making might help the economy a bit now, but the choices that they're making are going to affect us on a big scale. So it's, it's really, I'm just hoping and praying that they make the right decision for us and that maybe there is still hope that we can save the future today and then and we'll have a bright future and we can be the people we want to be, yeah. Do you guys agree with that? Do you think, do you have hope? Yeah, we do have hope. We, we, we do have hope, but given the situation inside the, 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 the negotiation tables, it doesn't look good for the Kyoto Protocol, and it, it doesn't look good for us little, little children who, who are going to suffer in the future, because those people who are in those rooms who are busy negotiating, tomorrow they won't be around. So they should have at least thought about those little boys and girls and those people across the Horn of Africa that are busy dying now. They should have thought about that instead of thinking about profit. So things don't look good now and we actually worry. Great, thanks so much guys. We'll check back in with you later in the week uh, or next week after things have developed a little more and see what your impressions are. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.